Hey all, Ron here from Military Images Magazine with a new episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail. You know, I'm occasionally asked to provide examples of Confederate military men who avoided taking the oath of allegiance. Truth is, I do find them from time to time, but it is a rare event. And I ask myself, why exactly is that? When you consider four years of death and destruction and the many letters that I've seen and researched, journal entries and other writings during the waning months of the war and the immediate post-war period, it's easy to imagine that a significant number of Confederate veterans would have refused to take any part in a paper that took the oath of allegiance to the Constitution. So here's another truth. These ex-Confederate soldiers and sailors, they had little choice, actually, if they wished to return to an active role in society in the United States. They really had to take the oath. Some of them really had no choice. Prisoners of war, Confederates who were trying to escape, those that finally gave up and turned themselves into federal military authorities, they really had no chance but to sign the oath. Now, this brings me to Robert E. Lee. I wondered, did he take the oath? In fact, he did twice. The first occurred in 1829. That's kind of the obvious one. After he graduated from West Point and was commissioned a brevet lieutenant in the United States Army. On this occasion, in 1829, he took the officer's oath of allegiance. The second time, the one that really captured my attention, was on October 2nd, 1865, months after the war was over, and he did it to get a pardon by President Abraham Lincoln's successor, Andrew Johnson. He did so, Lee did so, before becoming president of Washington College, which is today Washington and Lee University. On that date, October 2nd, 1865, he appeared in Lexington before notary public Charles A. Davidson and signed an amnesty oath. The exact words of that oath are these. I, Robert E. Lee of Lexington, Virginia, do solemnly swear in the presence of Almighty God that I will henceforth faithfully support, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Union of the States thereafter, and that I will, in like manner, abide by and faithfully support all laws and proclamations which have been made during the existing rebellion with reference to the emancipation of slaves, so help me God. Now, reading this text caused me to wonder, how was it received in the Northern press? Now, as you might imagine, not well. Here's one reaction from the Philadelphia Inquirer. It says, the same Robert E. Lee has already taken a part of the same oath as an officer of the United States Army. That's that 1829 oath I referenced earlier. The comment continues, a child of the United States, educated at the expense of the people and supported at our charge, and as he shamefully broke it upon the miserable pretense that he must go with his state, the fact that he has sworn the same oath a second time is not very interesting. He would doubtless break it again, did interest or passion incite him to do so. The fact is only interesting as a historical proof that the rebellion is over. As for the oath, we can say with Hamlet, quote, "'Tis deeply sworn as if he should break it now." End quote. So that's the Philadelphia Inquirer. I won't read others because they're all in a similar vein. I did look for some Southern commentaries on the matter, and I didn't find any. I could probably do some more searching, but 
at a cursory glance, came up with nothing. Now back to that second amnesty oath. It also made me wonder, and this is back to the original question at the beginning of this video about why more, why we don't find, why I don't find more officers and enlisted men who didn't take the oath. This led me to think about the idea that maybe the rank and file Confederate veterans followed the lead of their beloved General Lee. So I went down the research rabbit hole for some supporting evidence, and I found a letter written by Lee to Captain Josiah Tatnell of Savannah, Georgia. It's dated September 7th, 1865. That's a few weeks before he took the oath. It appears in an 1870 book, pardon me, 1874 book, Personal Reminiscences, Anecdotes and Letters of General Robert E. Lee by Reverend J. William Jones. Though the letter is private, it is easy to imagine that the advice Lee gave to Captain Tatnall is consistent with the same advice that he gave to others. It also, as you'll hear in the letter, I think it also syncs up with the post-war messaging that we know from Lee. The war is over. It's time to get back to being a peaceful nation. Lay down your muskets, pick up your plows, get back to the farms. Despite the serious issues he had with the government, it had become pretty clear that he wanted to get back to the business of running the country, even though he disagreed with what the government had become versus what it was before he left. Now, here's what Lee stated to Captain Tatnell. And I mentioned it was dated September 7th, 1865, near Cartersville, Virginia. Captain Josiah Tatnell, Savannah, Georgia. Sir, I have received your letter of the 23rd ultimate and in reply will state the course I have pursued under circumstances similar to your own and will leave you to judge of its propriety. Like yourself, I have since the secession of hostilities advised all with whom I have conversed on the subject who come within the terms of the president's proclamations to take the oath of allegiance and accept in good faith the amnesty offered. But I have gone further and I've recommended to those who were excluded from their benefits to make application under the proviso of the proclamation of the 29th of May to be embraced in its provisions. Both classes, in order to be restored to their former rights and privileges, were required to perform a certain act, and I do not see that an acknowledgment of fault is expressed in one more than the other. The war being at an end, the southern states having laid down their arms, and the questions at issue between them and the northern states having been decided, I believe, it is to be the duty of everyone to unite in the restoration of the country and the reestablishment of peace and harmony. These considerations governed me in the counsels I gave to others and induced me on the 13th of June to make application to be included in the terms of the amnesty proclamation. That's essentially the pardon by Andrew Johnson's, Johnson's administration. Lee continues, I have not received an answer. Remember, we're weeks away from him getting that answer. But whatever that may be, I do not see how the course I have recommended and practiced can prove detrimental to the former president of the Confederate States. He's talking about Jefferson Davis, of course. Lee continues, it appears to me that the allayment of passion, the dissipation of prejudice, and the restoration of reason will alone enable the people of the country to acquire a true knowledge and form a correct judgment of the events of the past four years. It will, I think, be admitted that Mr. Davis has done nothing more than all the citizens of the Southern states and should not be held accountable for acts performed by them in the exercise of what had been considered by them unquestionable rights. I have too exalted an opinion of the American people to believe that they will consent to injustice and 
it is only necessary, in my opinion, that truth should be known for the rights of everyone to be secured. I know of no surer way of eliciting the truth than by burying contention with the war. I enclose a copy of my letter to President Johnson and feel assured that, however imperfectly I may have given you my views on the subject of your letter, your own high sense of honor and right will lead you to satisfactory conclusion as to the proper course to be pursued in your own case. With great respect and esteem, I am your most obedient servant, R. E. Lee. So there you have the letter of Lee to Captain Tatnall, consistent with his messaging, as has been shown in numerous writings and his own here, that let's get back to work, let's get back to society. I'm not happy with the government. I'm not happy with the way things turned out. I think some of the leaders, like President Davis, have been uh, enduring some sort of injustice, and they should be treated as the rest of the ex-Confederates, and end of story. So, of course, he's looking to get out from under the four years of war and move on, which is not surprising, considering the loss. So there you have it. Thanks for listening. We'll see you on the next episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail.